My name is Walter Mills, and I'm dying. The doctors gave me six months tops. But before I go, there's a story I need to tell. A tale of secrets, madness, and the depths of human nature. It all started on a crisp autumn morning in 1962. I was a young sailor, fresh-faced and eager, reporting for duty on the USS Eldridge. The air buzzed with excitement and tension as we prepared for a classified naval mission. None of us knew what lay ahead, but we could feel the weight of importance hanging over us. As we boarded the ship, I noticed a group of figures standing apart from the rest. They wore flowing robes and crimson masks that covered their entire faces. Even from a distance, there was something unsettling about them. They moved with an eerie grace, almost gliding across the deck. "'Who are they?' I whispered to Ramirez, a grizzled veteran standing next to me. He shook his head, his thick mustache twitching. "'No idea, kid, but whatever's going on, it's big.' We watched as the masked figures approached Captain Hollister. Even our stern, unflappable leader seemed on edge as he spoke with them in hushed tones. After a brief conversation, they disappeared below deck, followed closely by the captain. Hours passed before Captain Hollister emerged again. His face was ashen, and his usual commanding presence seemed diminished. He gathered us all on the main deck, his voice carrying over the sound of crashing waves. Men, we're about to embark on a mission of utmost importance and secrecy, he began, his eyes scanning our faces. I can't disclose the details, but know this. What we do here may change the course of history. A murmur rippled through the crew. I glanced at Briggs, a young sailor with a mop of unruly hair, who was practically bouncing with excitement. The captain continued, his voice growing grave. Due to the nature of this mission, we must take extreme precautions. Each of you will be issued a cyanide pill. Keep it with you at all times. The deck fell silent. I felt my stomach lurch. In the event of capture or if the mission is compromised, you are to take the pill immediately. No exceptions. Myers, a burly sailor with tattoos covering his arms, let out a low whistle. Jesus Christ, he muttered. Captain Hollister's eyes narrowed. This is not a request, gentlemen. It's an order. As we filed past to receive our pills, I noticed Yendel, a quiet, nervous man, trembling slightly. His eyes darted around, never settling on one spot for long. Back in our quarters, theories flew wild. Briggs laughed it off, tossing his pill in the air and catching it. It's probably just sugar pills, he said with a grin. Scare tactics to keep us in line. Don't be an idiot, Ramirez growled. This is serious business. I sat on my bunk, turning the small pill over in my hand. What had we gotten ourselves into? The masked figures, the secrecy, the cyanide. It all felt like something out of a fever dream. As night fell and we set sail into the vast Pacific, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were heading into something far beyond our understanding. The gentle rocking of the ship did little to calm my nerves as I lay awake, wondering what horrors awaited us in the depths of the ocean. The sun had barely risen when a commotion erupted on the deck. I rushed out of my bunk, heart pounding, to find a crowd gathered around a fallen figure. As I pushed through, my stomach dropped. It was Briggs, lying motionless on the cold, metal floor. What happened? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Ramirez stood nearby, his face ashen. He took the pill, he said, shaking his head. Thought it was a joke. I stared at Briggs's lifeless body, his boyish face now twisted in a grimace. The mop of unruly hair I'd grown accustomed to seeing bounce around the ship now lay flat against his forehead, damp with sweat. His hand was clenched tightly, and I could see the remnants of the cyanide pill between his fingers. Clear the way! The captain's voice boomed across the deck as he strode towards us. His weathered face was set in a grim expression, eyes narrowed as he surveyed the scene. Sir, Myers growled, stepping forward, we need to turn back. This ain't right. The captain's piercing gaze locked onto Myers. We will do no such thing, sailor. Our mission continues as planned. A ripple of disbelief ran through the crew. Yendel, standing at the edge of the group, began to shake visibly. But sir, he stammered, Briggs is dead. We can't just... Enough! The captain's voice cut through the air like a whip. This is precisely why you were given those pills. The mission is paramount. We press on. I felt a chill run down my spine as the captain continued his voice lowering to a dangerous timbre. As of this moment, 
All communications are cut off. No messages in or out. Is that clear? A chorus of reluctant yes sirs echoed across the deck. As the captain turned to leave, he paused. Get that body below deck. We'll give him a proper burial at sea when time allows. I watched as Myers and Ramirez lifted Briggs' body, their faces etched with a mixture of anger and sorrow. The rest of the crew dispersed slowly, muttering among themselves. I approached Yendel, who was still trembling. You okay? I asked, placing a hand on his shoulder. He flinched at my touch. This isn't right, he whispered, his eyes darting around nervously. What are we really doing out here? I had no answer for him. As we made our way back to our stations, I couldn't shake the image of Briggs's lifeless body from my mind. The weight of the cyanide pill in my pocket seemed to grow heavier with each step. Throughout the day, tension hung over the ship like a thick fog. The usual banter and camaraderie were replaced by hushed whispers and suspicious glances. Even the endless expanse of the Pacific seemed more ominous now, its deep blue waters hiding untold secrets. As I manned my post, I caught glimpses of the secret ones moving about the ship. Their crimson masks gleamed in the sunlight, and their robes seemed to flutter even when there was no breeze. They spoke to no one, their presence a constant reminder of the mystery surrounding our mission. At one point, I saw Myers confronting one of them near the stern. His muscular frame towered over the robed figure, fists clenched at his sides. What the hell are you people? he demanded, voice carrying across the deck. The secret one merely tilted their head, the crimson mask revealing nothing. After a moment of tense silence, they glided away, leaving Myers fuming. As night fell, I found myself on watch with Ramirez. We stood in silence for a long while, the only sound the gentle lapping of waves against the hull. Finally, Ramirez spoke, his voice low. I've been at sea for twenty years, he said, eyes fixed on the horizon. Never seen anything like this. I nodded, unsure of what to say. Whatever's going on, he continued, it's big, bigger than us, bigger than Briggs. He turned to me, his weathered face grave in the moonlight. Keep your wits about you, kid. I've got a feeling things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Three days after Briggs's death, I woke to an unsettling stillness. The usual hum of the ship's engines seemed muffled, as if we were suspended in a void. I blinked, trying to adjust my eyes to the darkness, but it was impenetrable. What the hell? I muttered, fumbling for the light switch. It clicked, but nothing happened. I stumbled out of my bunk, hands outstretched, feeling my way to the door. The corridor outside was equally dark, filled with confused voices and the sound of people bumping into walls. Anyone got a light? Someone called out. A match flared to life, illuminating Ramirez's weathered face. In the flickering glow, I saw the confusion and fear etched on the faces of my fellow crew members. What's going on? Yendel's voice quavered from somewhere in the darkness. Power outage, maybe? I suggested. But even as I said it, I knew it wasn't true. This darkness felt... different. Unnatural. We made our way to the upper deck, hoping for some answers. As we emerged into the open air, a collective gasp rippled through the group. The sky above us was a blank canvas of pure black. No stars, no moon, just an endless void. This ain't right, Myers growled, his burly frame tense. Where's the damn moon? We stood there, a group of grown men reduced to wide-eyed children, in the face of this inexplicable phenomenon. The darkness seemed to press in on us from all sides, swallowing the beam of the few flashlights we'd managed to find. As dawn approached, we waited with bated breath for the first rays of sunlight to break through. But they never came. The sun, like the moon and stars, had vanished. All hands on deck! The captain's voice cut through the darkness, somehow even more commanding in the absence of light. We gathered around him, our faces ghoulish in the glow of his lantern. I know you're all concerned, he began, his eyes sweeping over us but we must maintain order and continue our mission. Mission? Meyer spat. What fucking mission? We're sailing in the dark to God knows where. The captain's gaze hardened. That's enough, sailor. Return to your posts and await further instructions. As we dispersed, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. The secret ones had emerged from below deck, their crimson masks gleaming dully in the lantern light. They moved with purpose carrying strange equipment I'd never seen before. 
Over the next few hours, I watched as they set up what looked like ham radios on the upper decks. Their hushed voices carried on the still air, speaking in a language I couldn't understand. What do you think they're doing? I asked Ramirez as we watched from our post. He shook his head, mustache twitching. Nothing good, I'd wager. As the day wore on, theories began to circulate among the crew, each one more outlandish than the last. It's got to be aliens, Yendel whispered, his eyes wide with a mixture of fear and excitement. They've blocked out the sun somehow. Don't be ridiculous, Ramirez scoffed. It's more likely we've sailed into some kind of government experiment. Maybe a new weapon that can control the weather. Myers, who had been pacing back and forth like a caged animal, suddenly stopped. What if there's been a nuclear war, he said, his voice uncharacteristically quiet. Maybe this is what the end of the world looks like. The thought sent a chill down my spine. I tried to push it away, but in the oppressive darkness, it was hard to keep the fear at bay. As night fell, or what we assumed was night, given the unchanging blackness, the atmosphere on the ship grew even more tense. The secret ones continued their mysterious activities, their movements becoming more frantic as time passed. I found myself standing at the railing, staring out into the inky void that had swallowed the ocean. The gentle lapping of waves against the hull was the only reminder that we were still at sea and not floating in some nightmarish abyss. A hand on my shoulder made me jump. It was Yendel, his face pale in the dim light of a nearby lantern. Do you think we'll ever see the sun again? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. I wanted to reassure him, to say that of course we would, that this was just some strange but temporary phenomenon. But the words stuck in my throat. In that moment, surrounded by endless darkness and mounting dread, I wasn't sure of anything anymore. I don't know, Yendal, I finally admitted. I just don't know. A week had passed since the darkness had enveloped us, and the atmosphere on the ship had grown thick with tension and despair. The constant blackness weighed on our minds, fraying nerves, and pushing tempers to the breaking point. I'd taken to pacing the corridors during what I assumed were night hours, unable to sleep in the oppressive gloom. As I rounded a corner near the ship's gym, a commotion erupted ahead. Raised voices and the sound of scuffling feet echoed off the metal walls. I quickened my pace, heart pounding. The scene that greeted me as I entered the gym was one of chaos. Myers, his massive frame silhouetted in the dim emergency lighting, had Yendel pinned against a wall. Yendel's feet dangled inches off the ground, his face contorted in pain and fear. You've been talking to them, haven't you? Myers growled, his face inches from Yendel's. Tell me what they're planning. Yendel's eyes darted wildly, his breath coming in ragged gasps. I don't know what you're talking about, he wheezed. Please, let me go. I stepped forward, my hands raised in a placating gesture. Myers, come on, put him down. This isn't helping anyone. Myers' head snapped towards me, his eyes blazing with a manic intensity I'd never seen before. Stay out of this, Mills, he snarled. This little rat's been sneaking around, whispering with those masked freaks. He knows something. Before I could respond, Yendel's knee shot up, catching Myers in the groin. The larger man howled in pain, releasing his grip. Yendel dropped to the floor, scrambling away. What happened next seemed to unfold in slow motion. Myers, recovering from the blow, lunged at Yendel with a roar of rage. Yendel, eyes wide with terror, grabbed a nearby dumbbell and swung it in a wild arc. The sickening crunch of metal meeting flesh filled the air. Myers staggered back, blood pouring from a gash above his eye. He touched the wound, staring at his crimson-stained fingers in disbelief. You, you little shit, he mumbled, his words slurring. Then without warning, he charged. Yendel, still clutching the dumbbell, tried to dodge, but Myers' bulk was too much. They crashed into a rack of weights, sending barbells clattering to the floor. In the struggle, Meyer's hand closed around Yendel's throat. I rushed forward, trying to pry them apart, but it was like trying to separate two magnets. As I grappled with Meyer's arm, I saw Yendel's hand disappear into his pocket. No! I shouted, realizing what he was about to do, but it was too late. Yendel's jaw clenched and his body went rigid. Foam bubbled at the corners of his mouth as the cyanide pill took effect. His eyes, wide with a mixture of fear and grim determination, locked onto mine for a brief moment before the light in them faded. Myers released his grip, stumbling backward. What... what just happened? 
he mumbled, the fight draining out of him as quickly as it had come. I knelt beside Yendel's lifeless body, my hands shaking. The dumbbell he'd used to defend himself lay nearby, now streaked with Meyer's blood. The silence that followed was deafening, broken only by Meyer's labored breathing and the distant hum of the ship's engines. As I looked up at Meyer's, I saw the dawning horror on his face as he realized what he'd done. The gash above his eye continued to bleed, the crimson stream a stark contrast to his rapidly paling skin. I... I didn't mean to... He stammered, his voice barely above a whisper. He was talking to them. I just wanted answers. I stood slowly, my mind reeling. We need to report this, I said, though the words felt hollow in my mouth. Myers nodded numbly, his eyes never leaving Yendel's body. As we made our way to find the captain, the weight of what had transpired settled over us like a shroud. The darkness that had consumed our world outside now seemed to have found its way into our hearts. The lines between right and wrong, sanity and madness, were blurring with each passing day. And as I glanced at Meyer's haunted expression, I couldn't help but wonder, how long before the rest of us succumbed to this creeping despair? I crept through the darkened corridors of the ship, my nerves on edge. Sleep had eluded me for days now, the constant darkness and mounting tension wearing away at my sanity. As I rounded a corner, a faint glow caught my eye, light spilling from beneath the cabin door. My heart raced as I approached. This was one of the cabins assigned to the secret ones I'd never seen inside before. Curiosity warred with fear as I hesitated outside. The sensible part of me screamed to turn back, but some deeper instinct propelled me forward. I pressed my ear to the door, straining to hear any sound from within. Nothing. Slowly, carefully, I turned the handle and eased the door open a crack. The sight that greeted me sent ice through my veins. One of the secret ones stood in the center of the small room, its back to me, but this was no human form beneath those flowing robes. The creature's body seemed to shift and undulate, as if made of living clay. As I watched in horror, it raised spindly arms, ending in two long fingers. With sickening precision, it began to slice into its own flesh, peeling back layers of skin to reveal pulsing organs beneath. There was no blood, only a viscous, oily substance that oozed from the wounds. My stomach churned as the thing manipulated its own innards, rearranging them like puzzle pieces. All the while, it emitted a low, keening sound that set my teeth on edge. I must have made some small noise of disgust, for suddenly the creature's head swiveled 180 degrees to face me. Where a face should have been was only a writhing mass of tentacles surrounding a single, unblinking eye. Terror gripped me. I stumbled backward, my heart thundering in my chest. As I fled down the corridor, that inhuman eye seared itself into my mind. When I finally stopped running, I found myself in a deserted part of the ship. Gasping for breath, I leaned against the wall and tried to process what I'd seen. It defied all logic, all understanding of biology. What were these things we'd brought on board? I stood on the bridge, my eyes straining against the oppressive darkness that had become our constant companion. The air felt thick heavy with an unnatural stillness that set my nerves on edge. Suddenly, the door creaked open behind me, and I turned to see the captain stumble in. My breath caught in my throat. The man before me was a far cry from the stern, authoritative figure I'd known. His uniform hung loosely on his gaunt frame, and his face was a mask of exhaustion and despair. Deep shadows carved hollows beneath his bloodshot eyes, and his skin had taken on an unhealthy, waxy pallor. Captain, I ventured, taking a hesitant step towards him. He didn't seem to register my presence. Instead, he shuffled to the center of the bridge, his movements jerky and uncoordinated. When he spoke, his voice was a hoarse whisper, barely audible above the low hum of the ship's engines. Goodbye, he mumbled, his gaze fixed on some unseen point in the distance. Goodbye. Goodbye. A chill ran down my spine as he continued to repeat the word, his voice growing more frantic with each iteration. I reached out to touch his arm, hoping to snap him out of whatever trance had gripped him, but he flinched away from my touch as if burned. Before I could make another attempt, the door burst open again. Myers barreled in, his face flushed and his eyes wild. 
The gun deck, he panted, gesturing frantically behind him. You've got to see this. Casting one last worried glance at the captain, who continued his eerie mantra, I followed Myers out of the bridge and down to the gun deck. The sight that greeted us there turned my blood to ice. The secret ones stood in a circle, their crimson masks gleaming dully in the flickering light of a makeshift pyre. At the center of their ring, bodies burned. The stench of charred flesh filled the air, making my stomach heave. What the hell? I gasped, struggling to comprehend the scene before me. Myers grabbed my arm, his fingers digging painfully into my flesh. Those are our crew, he hissed, his voice trembling with rage and fear. I recognized Briggs's watch. As the horror of his words sank in, a deafening crack split the air. The ship lurched violently, sending us stumbling. Water sprayed over the deck as massive waves began to pummel the ship from all sides. All hands on deck! Ramirez's voice boomed from somewhere above us. We're taking on water. Chaos erupted as crew members scrambled to respond to the sudden onslaught. I struggled to keep my footing as the ship pitched and rolled beneath us. Through the din, I could hear screams of pain as people were thrown against walls or struck by loose equipment. The secret ones remained unnaturally still amidst the pandemonium, their masks turned towards the raging sea. As another monstrous wave crashed over the deck, I caught a glimpse of something in the water a vast, writhing shape just beneath the surface. The storm intensified, its fury unleashed upon our battered ship with relentless force. I clung to a railing, my knuckles white with effort as the vessel pitched and rolled beneath my feet. The sky above, once an impenetrable void, now blazed with an otherworldly light. Flashes of sickly green and pulsing purple tore through the darkness, illuminating the churning sea in grotesque tableaus. With each burst of unnatural radiance, I glimpsed things that defied comprehension. Vast, writhing shapes that twisted and undulated just beneath the waves. Dear God, I whispered, my voice lost in the howling wind. A nearby cry snapped me from my horrified trance. Ramirez stood at the ship's edge, his eyes wild and unfocused. Before I could react, he climbed onto the railing. Ramirez, no, I screamed, lunging towards him. But I was too late. With a haunting laugh that echoed across the deck, Ramirez spread his arms wide and leapt into the roiling waters below. The sea swallowed him in an instant, leaving no trace of the man I'd known. I staggered back, my mind reeling from the loss. Another flash lit up the sky, and I looked up instinctively. What I saw froze the blood in my veins. Vast, tentacled monstrosities writhed across the heavens, their impossible forms twisting in ways that hurt to look at. Eyes larger than moons blinked lazily, focusing on our tiny vessel with malevolent interest. I felt my sanity fraying at the edges as I tried to comprehend the cosmic horror unfolding before me. A deafening crack split the air, followed by the screech of tearing metal. I whirled around to see a massive wave, easily a hundred feet high, bearing down on us. There was no time to brace for impact. The wall of water slammed into the ship with devastating force. I was thrown off my feet tumbling across the deck as frigid seawater engulfed me. For terrifying moments, I was submerged, unable to tell up from down in the swirling chaos. When I finally broke the surface, gasping for air, I found myself in the flooded bridge. Bodies floated around me, crew members who hadn't been able to escape the deluge. Their lifeless eyes stared accusingly as I treaded water, trying to make sense of our new reality. Through the shattered windows of the bridge, I saw the captain. He stood rigidly at attention, water lapping at his chest, his gaze fixed on something outside. I followed his line of sight and felt my mind threatening to snap. A colossal eye, easily the size of our entire ship, peered in at us. Tendrils thick as redwood snaked around the bridge, their suckers latching onto the metal with sickening pops. The creature, if such a mundane word could even apply, seemed to radiate an ancient, alien malevolence. The captain turned to me, his face a mask of grim resignation. Without a word, he drew his service pistol from its holster. Captain, don't, I started to say, but my words were drowned out by the thunderous report of the gun. The captain's body slumped into the water, carried away by the surging currents. I was left alone, treading water in the ruins of our bridge, face to face with an entity beyond human comprehension. The creature's presence filled the flooded bridge, an oppressive weight bearing down on my mind.
Its massive eye focused on me, and I felt an alien consciousness probing at the edges of my thoughts. Pain lanced through my skull as it burrowed deeper, sifting through my memories and experiences with cold, clinical precision. Images flashed before my eyes, my childhood home, my first day on the ship, the horror of discovering the true nature of our mission. Each memory was tinged with an otherworldly filter, as if viewed through a fractured lens. I gritted my teeth, fighting against the intrusion. Get out of my head, I screamed, my voice hoarse and raw. The creature's eye pulsed with an eerie light, and I felt its attention sharpen. The pain intensified, threatening to split my skull. I thrashed in the water, desperate to escape, but there was nowhere to go. As the alien presence delved deeper, I caught glimpses of its own alien thoughts. Vast, incomprehensible vistas of time and space that threatened to shatter my sanity. I saw civilizations rise and fall in the blink of an eye, entire galaxies swallowed by hungry voids. My mind reeled, teetering on the brink of madness. In desperation, I latched onto the one thing that had always anchored me, my family. I focused on the memory of my wife's smile, the sound of my daughter's laughter. Their faces bloomed in my mind, a bulwark against the cosmic horror trying to consume me. I love you, I whispered, clinging to the image of my family. I love you both so much. The creature's probing faltered, as if encountering something it couldn't understand. I pressed my advantage flooding my mind with every cherished memory I had of my loved ones. Our wedding day, my daughter's first steps, quiet evenings spent together. I poured all the love and warmth I could muster into these recollections. The pain in my head began to recede, and I felt the alien presence withdrawing. The massive eye blinked, and for a moment I sensed something almost like confusion emanating from the creature. Slowly, painfully, the tendrils wrapped around the bridge began to loosen. Water rushed in through the gaps, and I struggled to keep my head above the rising tide. The eye's gaze lingered on me for a moment longer, then it began to retreat into the depths. As the creature disappeared beneath the waves, I felt my consciousness slipping away. The last thing I saw before darkness claimed me was the image of my wife and daughter, their faces etched with worry and love. I opened my eyes to a blinding sun and the gentle lapping of waves. My body ached, every muscle screaming in protest as I tried to move. I was lying on my back, floating on what felt like a piece of debris. The sky above was a brilliant blue, dotted with wispy clouds, a stark contrast to the cosmic horrors I'd witnessed. How long had I been unconscious? Hours? Days? I turned my head slowly, wincing at the pain in my neck. In every direction there was nothing but endless ocean. My throat was parched, lips cracked and bleeding from dehydration. I closed my eyes again, trying to piece together what had happened. The ship. The storm. That monstrous eye staring into my soul. A shudder ran through me at the memory. Had it all been real, or some fever dream brought on by prolonged exposure? A distant sound caught my attention. The low thrum of an engine. I forced my eyes open, squinting against the glare. On the horizon, I could just make out the silhouette of a boat. Hey! I tried to shout, but my voice came out as a hoarse whisper. I waved my arm weakly, praying they would spot me. The boat grew larger as it approached. It was a fishing vessel, weather-beaten but sturdy. I could see figures moving on the deck, pointing in my direction. Relief washed over me as I realized they had seen me. As they drew alongside, a rope was thrown. I grabbed it with trembling hands, allowing myself to be pulled towards the boat. Strong arms reached down, hauling me aboard. I collapsed on the deck, gasping and shaking. Easy there, friend, a gruff voice said in heavily accented English. You're safe now. I looked up at my rescuers, a group of weathered fishermen, their faces etched with concern and curiosity. One of them, an older man with deep lines around his eyes, knelt beside me. Where, where am I? I managed to croak. About fifty miles off the coast of Guam, he replied. You're lucky we found you. What happened to your ship? Guam. We had been nowhere near Guam when whatever it was had happened. How had I drifted so far? I shook my head, unable to form a coherent answer. The fisherman patted my shoulder gently. Rest now. We'll get you to shore and sort things out there. As they bustled around me, providing water and a blanket, my hand brushed against something in my pocket. With a jolt, I remembered. 
the documents I'd stolen from the secret ones. Somehow, miraculously, they were still there, protected by a waterproof pouch. I closed my eyes, exhaustion overtaking me. But even as I drifted off, my mind raced. What secrets did those papers hold? What was the true nature of our mission and of the horrors we'd encountered? As the fishing boat docked in Guam, I stumbled onto solid ground for the first time in what felt like an eternity. My legs were wobbly, unused to the stillness of land after so long at sea. The fishermen who had rescued me spoke in hushed tones to local authorities, gesturing in my direction. I clutched the waterproof pouch containing the stolen documents close to my chest, acutely aware of their weight and the secrets they held. The next few days passed in a blur of medical examinations, debriefings, and fitful sleep plagued by nightmares of writhing tentacles and impossibly large eyes. When I was finally left alone in a small hotel room, I spread the damp pages across the bed, my hands trembling with anticipation and fear. The documents were a mix of ancient-looking parchments and more modern typewritten reports. Many were in languages I didn't recognize, flowing scripts that seemed to shift and change as I looked at them but there were enough in English for me to begin piecing together the horrifying truth. I worked tirelessly, barely sleeping or eating. As the sun rose and set outside my window, I delved deeper into the cosmic secrets laid out before me. Slowly, painfully, the truth about Eden began to take shape. Eden, I learned, was not a place but an entity, an ancient, cosmic being responsible for seeding life throughout the universe. Earth was just one of countless worlds touched by Eden's influence. The entity had arrived on our planet billions of years ago, nurturing the primordial soup that would eventually give rise to all life as we know it. But humanity's evolution had taken an unexpected turn. As our species grew in intelligence and complexity, we began to have an effect on Eden itself. Our thoughts, our emotions, our very essence was somehow feeding back into the cosmic entity that had created us. At first, this symbiosis had been beneficial. Eden grew stronger, more vibrant. But as human civilization advanced, something began to change. Our darker impulses, greed, hatred, selfishness, began to corrupt Eden. The entity that had once been a source of pure creation was now tainted by humanity's worst traits. The secret ones, I discovered, were an ancient order dedicated to protecting Eden. They had watched over millennia as humanity's influence grew more toxic. Now, they believed the only way to save Eden, and by extension, all life in the universe, was to destroy the source of the corruption, humanity itself. My hands shook as I read the final pages. The mission I had been part of, the ship I had served on, was just one small piece of a much larger plan. The Secret Ones were working to awaken Eden fully, to bring the cosmic entity into our world in its entirety. They believed that only by confronting humanity directly could Eden purge itself of our corrupting influence. As I stared at the last document, my mind reeling from the implications, a terrible thought struck me. The storm we had encountered, the monstrous forms we had glimpsed, had that been Eden partially awakened? And if so, what would a fully conscious Eden do to our world? I looked out the window at the bustling streets of Guam. People went about their daily lives, oblivious to the cosmic horror that lurked just beyond the veil of reality. I thought about my family, about all the families around the world. Did they deserve to be wiped out because of humanity's flaws? But then I remembered the cold, alien presence that had invaded my mind, the utter lack of empathy or compassion I had felt from that vast intelligence. If Eden had already been so corrupted by humanity's worst traits, was there any hope of saving it, or ourselves? I gathered the documents, my mind racing. What could I do with this information? Who would even believe me 